but perhaps the most common is that we will identify a, a country that has resources our corporations covet, like oil, and then arrange a huge loan to that country from the World Bank or one of its sister organizations. But the money never actually goes to the country. Instead, it goes to our big corporations to build infrastructure projects in that country, power plants, industrial parks, ports, things that benefit a few rich people in that country, in addition to our corporations, but really don't help the majority of the people at all. However, those people, the whole country is left holding a huge debt. and such a big debt they can't repay it, and that's part of the plan that they can't repay it. And so at some point, we economic hitmen go back to them and say, listen, you lost a lot of money, can't pay your debt, so sell your oil real cheap to our oil companies. Allow us to build a military base in your country or send troops in support of ours to some place in the world like Iraq or vote with us on the next UN vote to have their electric utility company privatized and their water and sewage system privatized and sold to U.S. corporations or other multinational corporations. So there was a whole mushrooming thing and it's so typical of the way the IMF and the World Bank work. They put a country in debt and it's such a big debt it can't pay it and then you offer to refinance that debt and, and, and pay even more interest and you demand this quid pro quo which you call a conditionality or good governance which means basically that they've got to sell off their resources, in, in, including many of their social services, their utility companies, their school systems sometimes, their, their, their penal systems, their insurance systems to foreign corporations. So it's a, it's a double, triple, quadruple whammy. Ecuador for many, many years has been ruled by pro-U.S. dictators, often relatively brutal. Then it was decided that they were going to have a truly democratic election. Jaime Roldos ran for office. And his main goal, he said, as president would be to make sure that Ecuador's resources were used to help the people. And he won, overwhelming, by more votes than anybody had ever won anything in Ecuador. And he began to implement these policies to make sure that the profits from oil went to help the people. Well, we didn't like that in the United States. I was sent down as one of several economic hitmen to change Roldos, to corrupt him, to bring him around, to let him know, you know, okay, you know, you can get very rich, you and your family, if you, if you play our game, but if you, just, if you continue to try to keep these policies you've promised, uh, you, you, you're going to go. He wouldn't listen. He was assassinated. As soon as the plane crashed, the whole area was cordoned off. The only people allowed in were U.S. military from a, from a nearby base and some of the Ecuadorian military. When an investigation was launched, two of the key witnesses died in car accidents before they had a, a chance to testify. A lot of very, very strange things that went on around the, the assassination of Jaime Roldos. I, like most people who've really looked at this case, have absolutely no doubt that it was an assassination. And of course, in my position as an economic hitman, I was always expecting something to happen to Jaime, whether it be a coup or assassination, I wasn't sure, but that he would be taken down because he was not being corrupted. He would not allow himself to be corrupted the way we wanted to corrupt him. And in that way, we've really created an empire, but we've done it very, very subtly. It's clandestine. All the empires of the past were built on the military, and everybody knew they were building them. So the, the British knew they were building them, the French, the Germans, the, the Romans, the, the Greeks. And they were proud of it, and they always had some excuse like spreading civilization, spreading some religion, something like that. But they, they knew they were doing it. We don't. The majority of the people in the United States have no idea that we're living off the benefits of the clandestine empire. That today there's more slavery in the world than ever before. And in a way, um, our government is, is invisible a lot of the time, and its policies are carried out by our corporations on one level or another. And then again, the policies of the government are basically forged by the corporatocracy and then presented to the government. They become government policies. So it's an incredibly cozy relationship. This isn't a conspiracy theory type of thing. These people don't have to get together and, and plot to do things. They all basically work under one primary assumption, and that is that they must maximize profits regardless of the social and environmental costs. Bank and IMF serve this role on a global scale. 
The basic scam is simple. Put a country in debt, either by its own indiscretion or through corrupting the leader of that country. Then impose conditionalities or structural adjustment policies, often consisting of the following. Currency devaluation. When the value of a currency drops, so does everything valued in it. This makes indigenous resources available to predator countries at a fraction of their worth. Large funding cuts for social programs. These usually include education and health care, compromising the well-being and integrity of the society, leaving the public vulnerable to exploitation. Privatization of state-owned enterprises. This means that socially important systems can be purchased and regulated by foreign corporations for profit. In the late 1960s, the World Bank intervened in Ecuador with large loans. During the next 30 years, poverty grew from 50% to 70%. Under or unemployment grew from 15 to 70 percent. Public debt increased from 240 million to 16 billion, while the share of resources allocated to the poor went from 20 percent to 6 percent. In fact, by the year 2000, 50 percent of Ecuador's national budget had to be allocated for paying its debts. It is important to understand the World Bank is, in fact, a U.S. bank, supporting U.S. interests. For the United States holds veto power over decisions, as it is the largest provider of capital. And where did it get this money?